episode of Off The Script, episode 141, part number one, to start your Hell in a Cell weekend off the right fucking way, man. We're gonna go in-depth, preview and predictions for WWE's triple main event this Sunday, live on the WWE Network, Hell in a Cell 2016, preview and predictions. Let's talk about it. JD from New York, 206, it's Hopper off the script, Big Show and Ryback, Strawman and Roman, get off my fucking TV, save me the misery, and all you fucking goons, just grab a cold beer, the man the hour is finally here. JD from New York, 206. It's time for off the script. JD from New York, 206. It's time for off the You know, for everybody that watches this show every single week, and for everybody that tunes into my channel every single day, even though I may be a fucking salty fucking bitch every now and then, man, y you gotta understand, people have their days, okay? People have their days, man. I work a job that you guys know I can't fucking stand. I have personal issues going on in my life that are bringing me to borderline depression, to be quite honest with you, you know? I don't know what the fuck's going on. But, I just got home from work, okay? It is 7.08. I got a live stream scheduled at 8.15 for WWE 2K17. For everybody that's on iTunes and Podbean and Google Play, you guys are going to be listening to this on Sunday, so, you know, you guys are going to be a few days late, but I definitely want to talk to you guys about this. I just got home from work, and I feel stressed already, and I got things planned this week. I'm taking a impromptu trip to New Jersey on Thursday which would have been yesterday, for you guys watching on YouTube on Friday. Uh, I took an impromptu trip to New Jersey on Thursday. I am working with another YouTuber out there. I'm not sure when the video is going up, so I will not say anything as of right now, but if it's posted, then obviously you guys know who it is and what I did. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But it's Wednesday, and I'm taking an impromptu trip out to Jersey, Lakewood, Tom's River area, um, on Thursday afternoon. Friday, which you guys will see off the script here on Friday morning, as always, 11 a.m., I'm taking a trip to Atlantic City with my brother. Okay, it's just me and him, and his bandmates are having this little birthday party for Caesar, who used to play guitar for Legionary. It's a little Halloween birthday shindig out in Mays Landing, New Jersey. Uh, we're going to be out there for, I believe, the day or the night or whatever. I'll be back on Sunday or Saturday. Maybe I'll be back on Saturday. I have no fucking idea what's going on. All I know is I'm driving. So I'm driving, and I got my iPod loaded up, and we're going to be good to go. But for, as for content, I, I'm, I'm really stressed to get it out in a timely manner, to give you guys quality, to make sure it looks good, sounds good, that I'm fucking healthy, my voice is good. And I want to get you guys content. I got so much brewing up here that... I want to get it out to you, and I can't because of all these different things. I'm glad that I'm busy because it, it it keeps my mind, you know, where it needs to be. Because if I didn't have all this shit going on, I'd be at the I'd be at the fucking bar drinking drinking my life away, you know. But I got home from work literally about I don't know half an hour ago, and I took the longer route to get home instead of staying on the highway and getting off at my exit. I got off the exit before I usually get off, and I took the long way home, and I was behind an SUV, 
And all of a sudden, I see a fucking kitten, a cat, run in the street. And I seen this. The SUV was right in front of me. And I seen the fucking cat dash across the street, or at least try to make it before the fucking car. You know? But the fucking SUV was speeding down a fucking side street, bro. A one-way side street that barely fits a fucking vehicle in between the two sides of the fucking road. It's like a fucking... I don't know, it's like a fucking sandwich. All you see is fucking cars parked on both sides of the street. And you see these fucking cars speeding in front of me. This one happened to be an SUV. And all of a sudden, I come to a fucking complete stop. A complete fucking stop. And I knew what happened. And I didn't want to get out of the car because I didn't want to see it because I knew it would ruin my fucking day. I didn't want to see it because I don't want to see things like that. I might be a heartless fucking cunt on some days, but that doesn't mean that I don't have compassion and love. You know? I get out of my fucking car, and the horrific sight of what had to be at least a two-year-old, three-year-old cat, it looked like it was a house cat. It didn't look like it was a cat in the wild. You know, cats in the wild, they look scraggly, and they got... They're all, they're all fucking fucked up. They're fucking adorable, but they're all fucked up. You know, because I know my mom has fucking stray cats in and out of her, in and out of her backyard. So you know what they look like. This one looked like it was a fucking house cat, man. It was beautiful. It was groomed. It had a fucking whatever the case may be. I get out of my fucking car, and, and the goddamn thing is twitching, twitching, blood dripping from its fucking mouth, twitching right in front of me, dude. I don't know what to fucking do. The car behind me which was a, a white Mazda, the two girls get out, two blondes get out of the car, and no, you fucking clowns, because I know what you're thinking, they get out, they start fucking crying, I put my hands in the air, and I scream, motherfucker, at the top of my lungs, so loud, that the neighbors... And one of the houses looked out the fucking window, and they're just looking. They don't come down to attend. I don't know if this is their fucking cat or whatnot. The girls are like, oh my god, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What do we have to do here? Fucking thing is twitching right in front of me. And it literally, it, it dies right there. Dead. It stops. It stops moving. It stops fucking breathing, everything. It stops. Dead. The asshole that ran it over, speeds away, makes the right turn, and he goes on about his fucking night. Little did he know he just fucking killed an innocent, beautiful, gray fucking kitten that I'm 100% sure belonged to somebody. And I have to be the one to fucking pick up the dead body of a fucking beautiful baby kitten, cat, and I put it on the side of the road because you know these fucking assholes in the city, they're going to speed, they're not going to give a fuck, oh, I don't give a shit, they're heartless. I pick it up and I place it on the side of the road. Hopefully, whosoever cat that was or maybe a neighbor sees it and they, and they tell the person that it belongs to, I don't know. I had to fucking physically, against my fucking inhibitions, pick this thing up because I didn't know what the fuck to do. It already fucking suffered enough. Pick it up and put it on the side of the road. And then the fucking cars behind me, the fucking balls on them. The balls on them. Wondering why traffic stopped. I yell again at the top of my fucking lungs. Go fuck yourself. You wait for me now. As I looked at the long line of fucking cars just backed up. Heartless. I hate New York City. I fucking hate it. The guy knew he ran something over too. You think he fucking stopped? No! Didn't stop at all. I get fucking sick when I run over a fucking squirrel on the fucking highway. This was a fucking cat that I had to see physically die right in front of me. Breathe its last breaths. Disgusting. 
Absolutely fucking disgusting how heartless some fucking people can be, man. So I picked it up, I put it on the side of the road, I get back in my fucking car, I thank the two girls that got out, because nobody else fucking got out. And then I drove home. Only thing on my fucking mind was Bacardi and my little baby Bailey. I get home, I take off my fucking hoodie because it's fucking cold outside, and I put my phone on the counter, I put my mail on the counter, I, fu I put my messenger bag, my work bag on the couch, and I fucking pick her up, baby Bailey, and I fucking kiss her, and she's like trying to fucking get out because she's hungry, but I didn't want to let her go, man. And then I looked at Bacardi, and I fucking kissed her. Love your pets, man. Seriously, love your fucking pets. Because if I gotta see that again, you know, I, I, can't, I can't bear to see that, man. Fucking kiss them, love them, hug them, tell them that you love them, show them that you love them, spend fucking time with them, you know. Th this happened on Wednesday. You guys are gonna be hearing this on Friday, everybody else on Sunday. You know? But you're listening to this on Friday, man. I want you to fucking stop the video and fucking kiss your dog, your cat, your bird, your fucking whatever, whatever you got, man. Whatever, whatever pet you got in your home, whatever, whatever you call a member of the family, show them and tell them and and care for them and love them. Because what I seen tonight just fucking ruined my whole night, man. I'm, never, I'm not going to get that vision out of my head. I look at my fucking cats and all I see is this fucking poor thing, this innocent thing, you know? Fucking thing they know it was gonna wake up this morning and fucking run over by some fucking asshole. Heartless fucking cunt. You fucking bitch. If I seen this motherfucker, I swear to God, if I seen him in a red light, I'd fucking halt traffic to pull up next to him and fucking get out of my fucking car and say something to this fucking motherfucker. Can't stand that shit, man. So please do that for me because I... I'm an animal lover. My entire family are animal lovers. My mom's got fucking stray cats she takes care of and buys food for and feeds every fucking day. We got Bruiser at home, which you guys have seen on my Twitter. You know, we got Bacardi and, and Bailey, you guys seen. It, it's disgusting, man. Just love your fucking pets, because it, it, I, I can't fucking stand it. I, I really can't. It's going to ruin my whole fucking night. But this is my show. And I quite frankly don't fucking care when or how or, or or what you want as far as wrestling. This is my fucking show. This is gonna be this is gonna be over an hour long. You're gonna get your wrestling news. This is my outlet to fucking speak because I work all fucking week. The holidays are coming up. They're giving me more hours against my fucking will. All I want to do is tell them to go fuck themselves. You know. I can't do that. But just do that for me, okay? Secondly, you guys might have seen, I posted a video on Twitter, I posted a video on YouTube. I got deleted by Matt Hardy, and it was a glorious experience. And I asked him to do this for me. I was actually the last person to meet and greet with him. And the meet and greet was two hours long, man. And it went way past the time that it was supposed to go to. They were supposed to end at like 7.30, 7.45. These guys went on until maybe an hour before they hit the ring. They, they, they were not going to stop until everybody had a picture and a, and a fucking... And a video or an autograph or a t-shirt, whatever the fuck they were doing. They didn't stop. And they weren't, they weren't going to stop. And my request was for him to delete me. And it was glorious, man. It was fucking great. It was my highlight of 2016. And if you guys want to see that video, I'll leave you an annotation, and I'll, obviously I'll put it down in the description below. It's glorious, if you guys have not seen it. And I am now deleted. I am now obsolete. But, um, about Matt Hardy and Jeff, it was, just like everybody had explained it to me, man, these guys are, are, are unbelievable. You know, Matt never broke character. Jeff was, uh, you know, good old Jeff. You know, he didn't have any makeup on because, you know, they were running late. And he even got into the ring. He didn't play his Broken Brother Nero character either. He was just regular Jeff Hardy like we usually see him. But Matt was in full character. And these these guys, man, both the Hardys are so fucking humble. And they were so fucking nice. 
And you can tell by their actions and everything else that they love this business and they love their fans, man. And that's that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable to me, man, because you hear these stories about these fucking WWE superstars that are fucking cocky and they won't sign an autograph or it's like fucking $25 for an autograph or this and that or they get pissed at you when you come up to them in the airport. Matt and Jeff Hardy were not going to leave their their booth until everybody was taken care of. The fans were first, and then the Hardys went to go attend to whatever they had to do, get dressed and get into character, and then hit the ring for a tag team match. And it was just a great experience, man. It, it, it really was, and it blew my mind how loyal and humble both of these guys were. And I wish them luck in anywhere they go, man. Whether they stay with TNA, whether they go back to Meek Mahan in WWE, you know, which I would, I would love to see both of them on, on SmackDown. But wherever they go, whatever they do, I wish them the absolute fucking best. And they have my full support because you don't find that. It's very difficult to find that, man. Loyalty and dedication to what you do. A lot of these people take it for granted. And a lot of people just fucking piss on some of the fans. And, you know, they don't give any, any respect to who, who, you know, to who got them there. You didn't see one sign of any disrespect from either Hardy, man. All you seen was love and love for the people that have supported them all these years. The kids signing titles, the fucking people coming up wearing Brother Nero t-shirts, people coming up with old school WWE photos and having them sign. It was just an unbelievable experience, man. And if I ever have the pleasure of actually talking to Matt one-on-one -on -one when he's not in character, I'll tell him, exactly you know, how much I respect what he and his brother Jeff are doing, and it's just fucking unbelievable, man. It's just completely awesome, and it was just a eye-opening experience to see both guys who we watch on TV each and every single week on um, TNA Impact, and they are so fucking nice in person. And my 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 thanks to, to Matt Hardy for doing that for me, man. It was just unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff, and I'll never forget it. You know, he made my fucking year completely. So uh, I want to thank him again. Also, I, I did get to call the match that I went to go see with Joe Cronin, which was fucking unbelievable. I can't wait to hear the audio. Uh, I was nervous. You know, Joe is uh, Joe was a is a born leader. He was the the lead play by play. You know, there was um, I don't know what kind of dynamic I was supposed to have with him. You know, we do out of nowhere and this and that, but. Uh, you know how you see play-by-play -play guys and you have your heel announcers like the Corey Graves and the JBLs. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I mean, me and Joe are such on even levels. You know, we were just calling the in-ring action. I, I tried to throw my sarcasm and my wit in there and hopefully it came out good, but that's something I definitely want to do, man. You know, I definitely want to get in and around New York City and do the lead play-by-play -play thing because I'm having a fucking blast. On my WW2K17 My Career stuff, man. I'm having a blast. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to give you guys something that Dank is not doing, that Pulse is not doing, that Emu's not doing, and Luigi and Tony Pizza Guy and Will Power, all these guys, all these big names in the 2K community. I want to do something different. I want to present it like you're actually watching the show on television. I want to present it to you like I'm actually calling the matches. And I'm getting practice with doing, you know, while doing that, man. And I'm having a fucking blast doing it. And I posted on Twitter, there's anybody in and around the greater New York City area, man, Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, New York, who have contacts with any of these indie promotions that come through here and that do shows, you know, let me know. Now, I want to I at least try out for maybe a play-by-play -play or, or a color commentator or something to get my name out there, to further my brand, you know. And my buddy Isaac Rojas, who's done artwork and thumbnails and layouts for me, certified fucking beast, one of my, one of my OG supporters, man. And he reached out to me, and we extracted, you know, you know, exchanged contact numbers, and he is a part of the House of Glory promotion here in New York City, and he told me about this training seminar that they got going on. Somewhere in the you know somewhere in Queens in in December, sometime in December, you know details still pending, but it's a tryout to be a commentator. And if they like you enough and you pass, and you know they like you and this and that, you have an opportunity to call their anniversary show. 
And the anniversary, the main event for the anniversary show is actually the Hardy Boys against the Dudley Boys. In what type of match, I don't know, but all I need to know is that the Dudleys and the Hardys are going to be there. Can you imagine JD calling a fucking Broken Matt Hardy match with Brother Nero against the Dudley Boys, Bubba Ray and Devon? I'm all over that, man. If you guys like what you see with the 2K, my career, you can only imagine what I do with actually with, with actual real, you know, professional wrestlers. All I got to do is, all I got to do, man, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. All I got to do is know who I'm talking about, know the wrestlers, know their maneuvers, know their statistics, maybe some of their background. I'm good to go, man. You know, I'm not a fucking Moro Ronaldo. I'm not a wrestling encyclopedia where I can name these fucking moves, you know, off the top of my head, but I know my shit. And that's something I definitely want to dive into, man. That's why Joe's got a good gig out there, man, with top rope promotions and, you know, whatever they're doing. He's got a good gig, man. That's that's some good shit right there. And I wish Joe all the luck in the world. Hopefully he gets his voice out there. Hopefully someone picks him up. He's great at what he does, man. Joe's a born leader. That's why I'm fucking work with him. He's out there. He's got connects. He's got a fucking great voice. And his voice actually is what attracted me to work with him. And I wish him nothing but the best, maybe a TNA, or a Ring of Honor, or a WWE, you know, gets out to him and reaches out to him, you know, send me your shit, so, it's great, and I just had a great time calling that match with Joe, man, it really got me thinking, and really got me to, to push about doing this play-by-play -play thing, man, and I do want to make mention before I forget, it was, uh, it was a, a absolute pleasure meeting Jake DeMarco, one of, one of uh, Joe's uh, partners from Monday Night Raw Review, uh, on Mondays, and it was just great meeting him, he's such a fucking nice guy, man, and uh, it, it was just great, it was just a great night, man, the, the whole Hardy thing, and the, and the deletion, and then calling the match with Joe, and meeting Jake, it, it was, it was just a big ball of just, it's unbelievableness, man, so it's, it was just a great fucking time, and uh, I just wanted to express that to you guys, because I haven't really done the audio podcast for you guys last week, I missed last week, and I apologize for that, people wanting it, but um, I figured I'd get all that out to you guys today, and you're understanding where I'm coming from. And I wanted to share that fucking miserable story that happened to me today, man. I, I still can't fucking stop thinking about it, but but whatever the case may be, man, we're here to talk WWE, and you guys are watching Off The Script, and you know what that fucking means. You know what that means, man. Oh, no! is not only the number one fucking podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Audio Boom, and Google Play Music, but this is the number one fucking podcast in your subscription boxes, right here on YouTube. Dot com. This is Off The Script, episode 141, part number one, for your Hell in a Cell weekend, man. Thank you so much for joining me. We are definitely going to talk Hell in a Cell, and it's not going to be good, man. It's not going to be good. Quickly, you guys know the deal. At JD from NY206 on Twitter. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, you guys know what to do, man. Hit that fucking big red button that says subscribe. And subscribe right here for the latest and greatest in WWE 2K17 action, WWE News and Rumors, podcast, late breaking news. I do it all. If you guys want WWE, nobody does it better than JD. All right. If you guys want to support the podcast, man, patreon.com. Thank you to everybody, including a big shout out to Travis, who just became the latest $75 a month patron. You motherfucker. Thank you so much, man. My, uh, my fucking, I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievably fucking humble that you want to be a, a pledge, man, and, and a Patreon like that, man. Unbelievable stuff. And if you want to join Travis and everybody else that's fucking pledged this week, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. You guys know the deal. Read the mission statement on there. Find out what I'm doing, why I'm doing this, how I got here, why I started it, where I want to take it, all that good shit, man. So that's patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys don't want to do that, man, and you don't want to support the podcast that way, 
You can always buy a t-shirt, man. All t-shirts directly affect the growth of this podcast. Barbershopwindow.com. All you got to do is go to the main menu, the home screen, type in off the script. It'll take you right to my online shop. You got a variety of different t-shirts, and I'm brewing, man. Get off my TV. He needs a new t-shirt. Even Marie's not on my TV. She's gone. I don't know where the fuck she is, but hopefully she stays there. But I got Dana Brooke on, I got Dana Brooke on my mind, bro. Maybe she can be version 5 of Get Off My TV. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I was thinking about maybe reenacting the scene from The Walking Dead, episode 1, season 7, where my boy Connor can recreate me, and I could be holding Lucille, and you have, I don't know, I don't know five, six, seven goons all lined up fucking on their hands and knees praying that I don't fucking take Lucille right to their skulls. And in each one of their fucking shirts would say Raw, you know? And that'll be the creative team. And I could just put Get Off My TV, you know, with the fucking hashtag and then Raw right there. I don't know. Or something along those lines. But I gotta see what, what could be done. But it's either that or Dana Brooke. Because I love that scene from The Walking Dead, man. And I'm the only one. Spoiler alert, if you didn't watch it yet, you should have by now. So, uh, no regrets, no fucks given. Um, I love that scene where Negan uh, did his thing and two fatalities were witnessed on Sunday night. Uh, everybody else cried. I smiled. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I think Negan's a fucking beast. And that's exactly the villain we need, man. I love good villains. They make me happy. So, uh, maybe we'll do that, but whatever the case may be, off the script merchandise, barbershop window... Anywhere in the world, man, 1999, they ship worldwide. No matter where you live, you're going to get your t-shirts, all right? WrestleCrate, WrestleCrate.com, and on Twitter at WrestleCrate, use the coupon code JDSENTME for an instant 10% off. Loot Crate, WWE Slam Crate, official WWE licensed product. We should be getting it any fucking day now. Still waiting on it, but if you guys want your own, if you guys want to enroll in WWE Slam Crate by Loot Crate, all you got to do is go down below. Go down below and use the link that I provide with the coupon code JD from NY. I'm going to save you some fucking money, man. 10% off your first loot crate. So make sure you guys do that right now. So you guys get in line for the next crate, which is bi-monthly. And finally, guys, big, big news here. Okay, my friends over at WrestleRumble.com. This is going to be one of the biggest pickums of all time. WrestleRumble.com has a hell in a cell pickum. And all you got to do is go to WrestleRumble.com and buy entry into this, man. Fucking dig through your couches, look through your fucking jeans that you wore earlier in the week, and fucking scrounge up a, f a couple of dollars and buy entry into this fucking thing, man, this pool, okay? Because you, 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 you're you going to want to do this, and you're going and you're gonna to see the fucking grand prize, and you're going to be like, you know what, I need to do this. And I'm letting you guys know right now, you got to do it because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You buy entry, okay? WrestleRumble.com. First prize is not only $500 cash, but you are going to get second-level seating for the Royal Rumble in the Alamo Dome, man. Two tickets to the 2017 Royal Rumble. How fucking unbelievable is that, man? How unbelievable is that? All you got to do is fucking find your way there, and you already got the tickets. To the biggest, or what they're saying is going to be the biggest Royal Rumble of all time. So make sure you guys go and do that, man. WrestleRumble.com. Solomonster, Labar, fucking Ryan Satin from Pro Wrestling Sheet. All the big names in podcasting. All the big names that work in this business are going to be taking part, man. How great would it be if you were ranked one or two ahead of those guys, man, who know their shit? So make sure you guys go, have some fucking fun with it, use your knowledge, and guess the winners and whatever else they ask you on Sunday night, you can win $500 cash and tickets to the Royal Rumble. Don't miss it. I'm telling you right now. I'm going to be in it, and we're going to have some fun. That's WrestleRumble.com. Now, guys, let's get on with the Hell in a Cell. This, I have, or I have had issues with Hell in a Cell. Over the last couple of years. And it just hasn't been the same, man. You know, we all know Monday Night Raw is fucking terrible. We know Monday Night Raw is abysmal. And I actually tweeted Mick Foley. I actually tweeted Mick Foley today on Wednesday as I record this. I tweeted him on Wednesday afternoon. I simply stated, serious question. 
Why is it that SmackDown uses all of their women per show? Every show you see an inkling of Carmella and Nikki and Natalia and Alexa and Becky, right, Naomi. You, you see all these women being used. But how come they have a two-hour show and they're doing that, but yet Monday Night Raw has a three-hour show and we see zero women? Now, I stated that we see zero women, but that's not really true. We do see a Sasha. We do see a, a, a you know, a, a Charlotte Flair, like they're calling her nowadays. Yeah, add more nauseating fucking verbiage to this overwhelmingly fucking pathetic excuse and attempt of a, of a, of a pay-per-view belt. Give me a fucking break. Charlotte Flair. Let me vomit up my fucking Panera salad that I had for lunch today all over the floor. Now they're calling her by her lily. I'm looking at WWE.com. What is the what is the point of adding the last name there? When for months they called her Charlotte. I would love to know. I'd also love to know why, Mick Foley, why the WWE women are not being featured on Monday Night Raw. It's nothing but a Sasha Banks and Charlotte shit show. Don't understand it. Oh, well, oh, well, we, 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 we got uh, Dana Brooke and we got uh, Bailey in an arm wrestling match on Monday. We got Dana Brooke. Fucking woman can't even put her pants on correctly. Never mind getting a fucking ring. And why does she look so out of shape? What the fuck are you feeding her and catering on Monday Night Raw? Jack Swagger doesn't approve, motherfucker. Jokes aside, Monday Night Raw is awful. The women's division is fucking awful. There's no women's division. There's no revolution, Mick Foley. There's no revolution, Stephanie McMahon. Every time I fucking pronounce McMahon, I'm gonna I'm just gonna say McMahon. Just rolls off the tongue beautifully. This is no revolution. This is a pathetic attempt, an excuse to say, oh, we did something first. Like these fucking assholes on YouTube, you know? When something comes out, I gotta be first. I gotta be first. Call of Duty, early access, I gotta be first to upload it. Who cares? Who cares? Nobody cares. I don't care. The crowd doesn't care. We see right through you, motherfucker. We see right through you, WWE. Give me a break. The women's championship is on the line in a Hell in a Cell match. Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins, the Universal Championship, which is... I don't know where the Universal Championship sits on this show. It's probably like fucking 78th on the list of priorities for this show. I think Corey Graves' shoe shining is more important than the Universal Championship at this fucking point. I honestly think Corey Graves' outfit right now and how fucking beast he looks with no tie and his tattoos are more important than the Universal Championship. And I mean this wholeheartedly. Seriously, I think Byron Saxton and his fucking nauseating attempt to speed talk when Bailey comes out about the inflatable fucking tube men, I think that's more important than the Universal Championship right now. I honestly think the Shining Stars itinerary for their real estate is more important than the Universal Championship. Why am I going to care about this match when all of those things are more important than the Universal Championship? But it's inside Hell in a Cell, people. It's inside Hell in a Cell. Roman Reigns and Rusev for the United States Championship. A match that's been built on family photos and a family photo album. And cheesy wedding jokes. And Roman Reigns drinking champagne. Toasting both Lana and Rusev after their second wedding and their fucking 77-day honeymoon. That's all this feud is built on. What happened to, I don't know, what happened to Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker feuding inside Hell in a Cell? Do you, you want to know why Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker had the first Hell in a Cell? Do you want to know why HBK and The Undertaker were inside the first Hell in a Cell at Bad Blood? Well, I don't know. In 1997, we had Bret Hart versus The Undertaker at SummerSlam that year in New Jersey. And, I don't know, Shawn Michaels was the special guest referee. 
If Shawn Michaels doesn't call this match down the middle, he doesn't get to wrestle in the United States again. You know, that was the stipulation. That was the stipulation. If Bret Hart loses, he gets shipped back to to, uh, to Canada. He's exported. Gone. Finished. Done. Meanwhile, the WWE Championship is on the line, held by The Undertaker. So all that rolled into one big ball. That makes for an intriguing matchup. What the fuck's going on? And still to this very day, it's the greatest ending ever to a championship match to grace the WWE television. Ever. If you want a, if you want a, a championship match the way it ended, you go to that match. SummerSlam 1997. Bret Hart versus The Undertaker with Shawn Michaels as a special guest referee. All you need to see is a steel chair being placed perfectly by one of the turnbuckles. Shawn Michaels sees it because Bret Hart was using it mere moments ago. Shawn Michaels picks it up. He's like, what the fuck's this? The, what, steel chair? You, you, did you use this against The Undertaker? Brett's like, no, no, no. He goes right back to kicking The Undertaker as he lays fucking defenseless in the corner. He fucking whips him around, Shawn Michaels does. Did you use this fucking chair? Bret Hart's so disgusted, he turns his head, and then he yells, fuck you, right in Shawn Michaels' face. He leans back, and he fucking spits a wad of spit that lands right on Shawn Michaels' fucking face. Gets right in his eye. Shawn Michaels gets so fucking pissed off, he takes this steel chair as if he's fucking Sammy Sosa battling Mark McGuire for the fucking home run record. Boom! Right across the fucking head. Undertaker's laid out. Shawn Michaels has no fucking choice but to count. Because if he doesn't call the match down the middle, he's fucking done. So he saves Brett's career. Brett stays in the United States, he's not shipped back to Canada, and Brett is the WWE Champion. Meanwhile, Shawn Michaels keeps his job, but he helped Bret Hart beat The Undertaker, inadvertently. Undertaker's pissed. Thus, we get Hell in a Cell. Thus, we get Hell in a Cell. The first, he- the first ever Hell in a Cell, which Kane debuted in one of the best debuts of all time. That's when Kane was actually get on my TV worthy. But you guys get my point. Why... Are any of these matches happening inside Hell in a Cell? Can, can you please explain that? To, I, I ask this wholeheartedly, bro. After what I just described to you. What is the main thing... What is the main thing that put both Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell? Anybody? I'm waiting for somebody to raise their hand. Anybody? You know? No? Okay, I'll answer it for you. The WWF Championship. Revenge. For being fucked over. I think that warrants enough to be inside Hell in a Cell. And after the match that they put on, one of the greatest fucking matches ever in WWE history. Again, I ask you, um, why is Sasha Banks and Charlotte Flair inside Hell in a Cell? Why is Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins inside Hell in a Cell? When the list is more important than the Universal Championship. Why are they in Hell in a Cell when fucking Sheamus' mohawk is more important than the Universal Championship? I don't know. I don't know. I'm asking myself this fucking very question. Roman Reigns and Rusev, why are they in Hell in a Cell? Uh, I don't know. Because WWE wants to pretend... They want to pretend like they got a big event on their hands. Meanwhile, what are you doing? What are you doing after what I just described to you with Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker and Bad Blood? What are you doing? You're taking the one match that was created due to what I just explained and you're giving me that times three with absolutely no build-up at all for any of these matches. Then, then, then you'll have someone tell me, oh, J.D., Charlotte, and, and Sasha Banks has build. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. They had build in NXT. But once Sasha, Charlotte, and Bayley hit the main roster, they are fucking unimportant. They're only important because of what they bring as far as name value goals. Sasha, Charlotte, and Bayley are fucking sheep puppets in WWE's agenda. It could have been anybody else. They were in the right place, 
at the right time. So WWE is using these women in some sort of fucking movement on Monday Night Raw. The only movement that I see from everybody is picking up the fucking remote control to change the goddamn fucking channel on Monday nights. There's no movement. What movement are we watching, Mick Foley and Stephanie Meek Mahan? What movement? My bowel movement is the only thing that's fucking moving. Because I'd rather be sitting on the fucking toilet than watch your fucking show. And then when I actually do go, I look down in the fucking water and I see what is, or at least what resembles, Monday Night Raw. Your show is a complete piece of fucking shit. This pay-per-view, and some of you might think I'm being harsh. No, I'm being a realist here. I'm being a fan. This is a fan speaking of over 30 years that I've dedicated my fucking life to watching WWE. 30 years! I don't have to be in the business. I don't have to be a fucking Dave Meltzer. I don't have to be a Vince Russo. I don't have to be a this one and a that one. Anybody can do what these guys do. Anybody. You pick a random Joe Schmo on the internet from fucking Reddit and I guarantee you he can book a better show than these fucking clowns on Monday Night Raw. No, but we're getting a triple main event. Three Hell in a Cell matches in one night. How? How do we water down Hell in a Cell? How do we make Hell in a Cell unimportant to the masses. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. The last couple of years, the last several years, in fact, we haven't seen blood. Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker on a fucking blade two minutes in after their last Hell in a Cell match. How do we water it down? How do we make it feel unimportant? Pretend I'm Vince McMahon. Because this is what they do in, in the fucking boardroom. How do we make Hell in a Cell unimportant? Oh, yeah. I know, Vince. We got these... We got these tree feuds. What do we do? Tree house share. That's... That's the fucking creative goon that they got riding Monday Night Raw. Completely abandoned what made this match hellacious, brutal, bloody, right? Abandon everything that this match has meant to guys like Shawn Michaels, The Undertaker, Triple H, who's still there, by the way. And I'm ashamed at him that he's allowing this to go on because he was in there against the one man who almost fucking killed himself in that very structure. Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Brock Lesnar. The list goes on and on, you know? Why? Are they devaluing such a demonic structure that should be the end all to a feud such as a Shawn Michaels and an Undertaker? I don't get it. None of these matches on any fucking level do not even come close. Do not even come close at all. Could never come close. WWE could never script anything to be that close to what we've seen in the golden days of Hell in a Cell. Sasha, Charlotte, Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins, and Roman Reigns and Rusev is nothing but a pathetic attempt to sell the name of this pay-per-view. Instead of giving me one Hell in a Cell with weeks and weeks and weeks of story behind it. Conflict struggle two fucking guys who completely hate each other for whatever reason with the universal championship on the line that's all i want all i need is one all i need is one but no we're getting three we're getting three by the first one i'll be done by the first one i don't want to see anymore by the last one I'm going to come on here on Sunday night and I'm going to rip this pay-per-view to shreds. I, I just see it now. I see it now. And I could sit here and wholeheartedly tell you with a straight face that the people who are in charge of Monday Night Raw should be fired. 
They do not represent WWE. They are not what's best for business. They don't give a fuck about Monday Night Raw. They don't give a fuck about the progression of how a storyline should go. They don't give a fuck about the talent. All they care is about cheap entertainment and cheap laughs and the list and all these other things that are fucking vastly unimportant. But Monday Night Raw's ratings. What did I tell you? Goldberg did a 3.1. You know what WWE did this past Monday? 2.01. And then they want to know why ratings are in the fucking tank. They want to know why Monday Night Raw lost all their viewers. Because you don't give a fuck about the viewers. You want to make history. All I want is wrestling. You want to make history. And you want to proclaim Banks and Charlotte need to be in there because it's a revolutionary fucking movement for the women. What are they in there for? What are they fighting for? They're not fighting for the fucking title because they didn't make the title mean anything in their last segment and they haven't said a goddamn thing about the fucking title. All Charlotte said is, all Charlotte said is, I'm taking my title back. Why? What mean, what does the title mean to you? Sasha, you have the title right now. What does the title mean to you? How important is the title to you that you're actually stepping inside Hell in a Cell? What will you do to keep that title? I don't know. I'd love to hear an answer. You know? Shawn Michaels had to step inside Hell in a Cell for the mistakes that he made. What the fuck you think he was thinking? With The Undertaker. The most physically dominating performer in WWE history. Do you think WWE let that slide weeks leading into that match? You didn't think they chronicled Shawn Michaels and what his mindset was stepping inside this fucking thing, the unpredictability with The Undertaker? With the idea of Kane looming around? Is he with The Undertaker or against The Undertaker? No, but these women need to be inside Hell in a Cell. For what? Because we're making history. Disgusting. Absolutely fucking disgusting. If it doesn't warrant, if the feud doesn't warrant this type of match, there's no reason for them to be in there. I don't want to see two women, 110 pounds each, inside a fucking cage that should only house men. And I'm not saying that because I'm against what the women could do. I don't want to see Sasha Banks soaking wet at 95 fucking pounds inside Hell in a Cell. What do they have planned? It's not going to live up and pay homage to what the structure really is. WWE killed that years ago. No, but are we going to see a moonsault? Are we going to see blood? Are we going to see them fight for what is really important? Am I going to see... Am I going to sit at home and see them fight over what is most important? Which is the women's championship? Or is this really WWE throwing two women in there because they want to make history? Because nobody else has done it before. Let me tell you something. All because you're doing something for the very first time doesn't mean that it's right. And it doesn't mean that it's the best. Or that it needs to happen. You, may, you do things for the sake of it making sense. And the storyline and what we've been given on television does not make sense. Simple. None of these matches make sense. None of them. You got Kevin Owens who's the Universal Champion. Why? Why is he inside Hell in a Cell if the Universal Championship has been positioned as the third most important title on your show? The Women's Championship and the United States Championship are more important than the Universal Championship. But Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins are inside Hell in a Cell. I don't know whether they're auditioning for a fucking comedy act or they're really fighting over the Universal Championship. Which one is it? You know? The list was supposed to be something that was witty. Funny. You know? It was supposed to get Chris Jericho... I don't know, more over. It was supposed to make his character that much better. And he was great already before he even came out with the list. It wasn't meant to be 
that the list is more important than the Universal Championship. WWE seen that they had another marketing scheme in front of them, another fucking winner here with the list. They put it on a t-shirt. They're fucking making it into memes all over the fucking place. 10 second Vine clips. Twitter fucking social media tweets and Facebook fucking tweets. Get, get the fuck out of here, dude. All of that is more important than the Universal Championship. Their effect of what the list is and what the list means to them on social media is more important than Kevin Owens being the Universal Champion. Now you want to know why I have a fucking disdain for Monday Night Raw. You know? AJ Styles, though this thing with James Ellsworth, you know, I understand why they did it. I don't have to like it. I'm 50-50 on it. But AJ Styles has always been, ever since he won the championship, the number one guy. The number one guy. They always position him as the number one guy, whether he's on the microphone, on the fucking face that runs the place, you know? Whatever the case may be, he is always the number one. People know who AJ Styles is. Kevin Owens is positioned behind everything else and is made to look like not a priority on Monday Night Raw. Roman Reigns, he's in a good position in which he's the United States Champion. I don't care. I, I don't care what he does. Seriously. Rusev? Rusev's dead to me. You had Rusev great when he was the United States Champion. Then you fed him to John Cena. Then you put him in the League of Nations. And I thought it was actually going to take longer than what we've seen for him to be built back up. WWE built him back up and they took the title off him again. Who is he now? Rusev is directionless now. Where do you go with Rusev from here? Anything that you do with Rusev coming out of this feud with Roman Reigns, he will be lost. And nobody will care. Unless you put him with someone who is completely white hot. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Those are all my frustrations with Hell in a Cell. As far as who wins, I don't see Charlotte winning this match. At all. Because they wouldn't have gave the title to, Sha to Sasha Banks. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't have gave the title to Sasha Banks a couple weeks back. I would have saved it for Sunday. But who the fuck am I? I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm some fucking internet asshole who fucking speaks a lot and is always negative. Now, but you can continue to be blind. I don't know what the fuck you're watching. I know what I'm watching. You know? Tweet it to Mick Foley. Tweet the videos to Mick Foley. I don't fucking care. Everybody knows I'm right. I don't have a job in WWE. I can say whatever the fuck I want. Mick Foley, you continue to pander to the fucking political agenda and give me the runaround with the answers that I see you give people on social media. You couldn't even answer my fucking simple tweet about why does SmackDown have six women on the show every fucking week and we are left without Summer Rae, Alicia Fox, Nia Jax, Tamina, and whoever the fuck else you drafted to Monday Night Raw. Why? Is Nia Jax only worth superstars? I mean, these are women we want to see. Now, I don't know if you're watching NXT, but NXT doesn't have fucking arm wrestling matches going on on their television to build hype between a match that you're putting on a pay-per-view. No, there's actually wrestling going on down in NXT. There's storyline and character progression in NXT. I don't know what... Monday Night Raw is doing, but apparently Nia Jax is not a vital part of this women's division. Now, all they're, all they're worried about is Hell in a Cell. And the reasons why this match will be a complete fucking embarrassment to everything that Hell in a Cell is. Now, that's all they care about. You know? Those are my gripes with everything. Sasha is going to win. No reason why they're taking the belt off of her, even though Charlotte is proclaiming she has a 12 pay-per-view winning streak. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Nia Jax can certainly be a wild card here if WWE wants to get creative. But I'm not going to go with that. Why would WWE do that? WWE and creative in the same sentence in a positive manner? Fuck no. Everything that you think should happen, WWE is going to think the opposite. I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson. I would love to see Nia Jax come in and proclaim that she now has been held back and is the number one contender because there's no woman on the roster that can beat her. Relive 1997 WWE 
and have Nia Jax come down and fucking destroy that cage door and destroy not only the winner, but the loser of that match on Sunday night. If I do not see that, that is a blown opportunity to get that woman over. You want Nia Jax over as a dominant fucking monster? That's what you do. You don't keep her on superstars. That's what I have to say about that. Sasha Banks wins. I would have saved Sasha winning the title at the pay-per-view, but again, what the fuck do I know? You know, they want to give her the title on Raw in a main event on Monday Night Raw that meant nothing instead of giving her the title in her own hometown, which would at least, you know, given the Hell in a Cell some meaning. But no. no. They want to give her the title two weeks ago, and now this match means nothing. And it's nothing but a fucking, oh, look at me, I'm here, moment for WWE. Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. Couldn't give two fucks about this match. Kevin Owens is going to win. No reason to take the title off of Kevin Owens. I believe Seth Rollins and Triple H will eventually butt heads here. And Kevin Owens has had a shitty run with the Universal Championship. But it's not his fault. By any means, it's not his fault. WWE just has everything else more important than the Universal Championship. Kevin Owens will win this match. U.S. Championship, Roman Reigns versus Rusev. Roman Reigns will win this match. No reason to believe why Rusev is going to win this match at all. You know, I have at least some faith in Roman Reigns to deliver a decent match. The last Hell in a Cell match that he had with Bray Wyatt was fucking great. So hopefully Roman Reigns can deliver another great match here with Rusev. Cruiserweight champion TJ Perkins versus Brian Kendrick. Has WWE made me care about this match? Fuck no. Absolutely not. This is another thing that fucking pisses me off. All the cruiserweights are a failure. All the cruiserweights, I told you they'd fail. No, the cruiserweights didn't fail, motherfucker. WWE has made the cruiserweights fail. Because they obviously did not watch the cruiserweight classic. You can make purple lighting and you can put purple ropes on Monday Night Raw and you can do the traditional handshake that they did during the tournament on the WWE Network. That is the least of your concerns. But what you want to do is you want these guys to go out there and fucking come out there at 8 o'clock and steal the fucking show on Monday Night Raw. Or when you start a pay-per-view, have them start the opening fucking match. No, but these guys go on at 10.30. These guys are fucking going on when people are ready for bed. Nobody gives a fuck about them. You know, fuck putting them on when the crowd is hot and when the crowd's awake. You know? No, we'll put them on at 10.30. That's mistake number one. Number two, you're giving these guys, especially TJ Perkins, I mean, go back and watch his match with Kota Ibushi, man. I mean, seriously, go back and watch Brian Kendrick's match with Kota Ibushi. Were these guys given three minutes in the fucking Cruiserweight tournament? Of course not. No reason why these guys should be under ten minutes. None. Bullshit. You want something to get over, and you want something to be successful, let them go. It's like a dog on a leash in the fucking park. Throw the frisbee and let them go. Why are they being held back? Fucking pisses me off all their failures. Yeah, Vince McMahon let them fail. Clearly he didn't watch the CWC. Because if he did, the essence and what made that fucking entire 10-week program great is the fucking originality and the fact that they let these guys go. They haven't been given that go on Monday Night Raw. Why? Because we gotta see fucking Titus O'Neil in the ring? We're cutting time from the shining stars and fucking golden truth. Give me a fucking break, man. Seriously. You're too busy making up fucking itineraries and making the, the, the shining stars a real fucking brochure for a fucking real estate and property that doesn't even exist. Meanwhile, you can't give TJ Perkins three fucking minutes on Monday Night Raw. Absolute fucking bullshit. Then you got the other cruiserweights who I would love to see on Monday Night Raw in the fucking pre-show. What, you're gonna give them three minutes on the pre-show too? Complete fucking embarrassment. Of everything that was great about the Cruiserweight Classic. Yeah, let's put them on the pre-show. Who watches the pre-show? Nobody. Cedric Alexander on the pre-show. Lindsay Dorado on the pre-show. 
Tony Nice on the pre-show. Instead of letting these guys go out there on Monday Night Raw and give me 15 fucking minutes, you know? The more people see what these guys can do week to week, people will know, okay, that's Tony Nice, or okay, that's Cedric Alexander, or that's fucking Grand Metallic. That's Brian Kendrick. No, but we're supposed to understand and get invested in three minutes on Monday Night Raw. I'm glad it fucking failed. You know why? Because the people running Monday Night Raw are goddamn fucking clueless. Put them to SmackDown. Bring them over to SmackDown. At least we'll have Moro and Alo fucking hyping these guys up. At least they'll be on Daniel Bryan's show, so we'll have at least some essence of that Cruiserweight Classic back. And SmackDown can certainly use the fucking matches on their end. At least they won't give them fucking three minutes on a three-hour fucking program. Give me a fucking break. Monday Night Raw is fucking garbage. Absolutely garbage. TJ Perkins. Honestly, I think Perkins is going to lose. The way they're building Brian Kendrick. Oh, I need this. I need this. You know? What got me invested in Brian Kendrick was what he did and what he said about his time in the Cruiserweight class. He needed that. The fucking mo the moment that he had with Daniel Bryan after he lost to Cody Ibushi, man, I fucking started to tear up because of the interviews and the fucking sit-down segments that I seen this guy go through. And then when he hugged Bryan and they made a huge thing about Bryan and Kendrick and how, how great of friends they are. Am I emotionally invested in Bryan Kendrick now on the main roster? Of course not. They soiled him with terrible acting, bullshit feud, and no direction. Who cares? Who cares? I think Kendrick is going to win. Tag Team Championships. You think the New Day is going to lose? You think the WWE is going to shed the Demolition's record and keep Demolition as the number one team in history for longest reign? Of course not. New Day is going to win. Cesaro and Sheamus may have gotten a win there, but New Day is going to win. And this is interesting because Cesaro's contract is coming up. Will he say or will he go? I don't know. But he needs to be on SmackDown as well. Enzo and Big Cass versus Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. Do me a favor, go back to New Japan. I don't see. You know, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a bold I'm gonna make a bold fucking statement here. You know, I'm going with I'm going with the club. Or Gallows and Anderson. I'm going with them. I really am. They need a win. And if WWE doesn't see that, there's no saving the fucking stupidity that resides and lives in that company. Enzo and Big Cass don't need. A win. They are over. If they can get over without microphones and have the entire, and the, the entire audience fucking chant along with their catchphrases, they don't need a fucking win, bro. That's going to be like that every single week. Gallows and Anderson need to beat a top team, the most popular team, to say, you know what? Fuck everybody. And decisively, too. I want to see a fucking boot of doom. I want to see magic killers. Two big casts. Done. I'm going with Gallows and Anderson. Dana Brooke versus Bailey. <sighs> Bailey. That's all you need to know. And the cruiserweight match, Cedric Alexander, Lindsay Dorado, and Sin Cara versus Tony Nese, Drew Gulak, and Aria Davari in the kickoff match. I'm going with Tony Nese, Gulak, and Davari to win that match. Why? Because WWE is very high up on Tony Nese. That's what I'm going with. That's your Hell in a Cell. Preview and predictions. If I was a little harsh, go fuck yourself. That's how I truly feel about this pay-per-view. It's a complete fucking disaster. It's nothing but a pathetic attempt to feel important. And WWE, going into this, they got nothing. Why? Because Goldberg and Brock Lesnar was already announced for Survivor Series, and that's all anybody's talking about. And they're slowly fucking that up as well. So, there you go. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you think down below. Leave me a like. Leave me a comment. This was, I know, a little talk heavy in the beginning, but hopefully my review and everything that I had fucking boiling up here all day came out pretty good for you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back with part two. We got actual news and rumors this weekend, so don't go anywhere. Off the script. Part two coming on Saturday morning. Until then, thank you guys so much. I'm JD, and I'll see you right back here for the number one fucking podcast. In your subscription box is right here on YouTube.com. Off the script. I'll see you guys on Saturday morning.